Stop it! What are you doing? On the way to visit my husband's grave, my brother-in-law suddenly hugged me. Sure. Be quiet. Look at the man and woman in the shade of the trees. As I tried to shake off his hand, he moved to hide me and pointed in a certain direction. What? No way. There, I saw my husband, who was supposed to be dead, embracing a woman. The shock made my mind go blank. But then, I suddenly realized my huge misunderstanding. I had been completely deceived by them. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And so, my story of revenge began. Life is like a drama. Even so, my experience might be a little special. The man I married was a classmate from junior high school, and four years had passed since our wedding. While working hard as a nurse, I spent my days with him, who, though plain in appearance, was always bright and cooperative. Our adorable daughter, who was born to us, had just turned three and was growing up healthy and full of energy. A close friend from long ago lived in the next town, and I often turned to her for advice. We lived with my husband's family, but they didn't interfere with us, and they were all very kind. The only things that concerned me were that my brother-in-law, who was supposed to be an elite, always seemed a little cold and that my husband's salary at his company had been decreasing. At the time, I was convinced that my married life was going smoothly. All I could do was listen to my husband's complaints about his company. My company is small compared to my brother's, and business has been bad lately. On top of that, my boss doesn't recognize my abilities and is preventing my promotion. That must be tough. My salary is going down, and my bonus has been cut in half. I'm losing my motivation to work. I see. Although he didn't show me his paychecks, I noticed that the $1,000 he used to give me for living expenses had been reduced to $500. Things were indeed getting tight, but I was also working, and we didn't have to pay rent because we lived in the house inherited from his grandfather. I'm considering changing jobs, but it's not going well. I'll keep trying for the family's sake, so bear with it for a while. Of course, we'll get through this together. I didn't think too seriously about his job at the time, but I would later regret that. Another thing that bothered me was my brother-in-law, who had avoided eye contact with me ever since we first met. Whenever I felt his gaze and turned around, he would deliberately look away, making me wonder if there was something he didn't like about me. One time, when I noticed him staring at my daughter, I felt uneasy. What's wrong? Oh, it's nothing. He averted his eyes, but I had an uncomfortable, lingering feeling, so I decided to talk to my husband about it. My brother has always been smart and proud. A lot of women come on to him, but he's never shown any interest in them. He's a bit of an oddball. I see. But why does he avoid me? He probably doesn't like that his less capable younger brother has a pretty wife and a cute kid. We've never gotten along, so don't worry about it. His explanation didn't fully satisfy me, so I invited my friend to lunch and asked for her opinion. You know, I've always thought you were living the high life. What? What do you mean? A kind husband, a good relationship with his parents. I'm jealous. Complaining about your brother-in-law being a bit cold seems ridiculous. It was rare for her to speak to me so harshly, which felt off. 
What's wrong? Are you worried about something? No, no, let's not talk about me right now. You need to focus on supporting your husband, okay? She quickly shifted the conversation away from herself, not revealing anything at the time. Someday, when she opened up to me, I'd be there for her as much as I could. I felt grateful to have such a caring friend who was always putting me first. Not long after that, something happened that made all my previous worries seem insignificant. That day, I was off work and busy catching up on household chores. Meanwhile, my husband, who should have already left for work, lingered at home. I noticed he didn't look well. You should go soon, or you'll be late for work. I know, but I don't want to leave Ashley. He hugged our daughter tightly. It was unusual for him to act that way, which made me feel uneasy. Are you sure you're okay? You don't look well. Yeah, I might have a cold. I'll be going now. He smiled faintly and left the house. If only I had listened to him more carefully then, maybe things wouldn't have turned out the way they did. Around noon, I received a call from his workplace, telling me he hadn't shown up. I immediately tried calling his phone, but he didn't answer. The uneasy feeling from that morning grew, and I rushed into his study where I found something shocking on his desk. I can't go on anymore. Nothing is going right. I'm sorry, Anna, Ashley. I'll make up for it with my life. Thank you for everything. It was a suicide note. I stood frozen, clutching that letter. I contacted my in-laws, friends, and his acquaintances, but no one could find him. Fearing the worst, I reported him missing to the police, but there was no trace of him. From that day on, I spent sleepless nights filled with worry. My friend, while offering some comfort, also spoke harshly to me. I told you to support him more. You just left him to deal with everything alone, didn't you? I knew she didn't mean any harm, but her words cut deep. Maybe it's my fault. He was struggling with his job, and I didn't tell him it was okay to quit. I should have been more supportive. I blamed myself, and combined with my lack of sleep, I found it hard to focus at work. Even my daughter, who had just turned three, began crying more often likely sensing my anxiety. Then, my brother-in-law started visiting us daily. Anna, you don't look well. You haven't been sleeping, have you? He tried to put a hand on my shoulder, but I instinctively brushed it away. You were so energetic in middle school, swinging that racket around, but now you've become so thin because of my brother. What? How do you know what club I was in? I had attended a large middle school with over a thousand students. We had never spoken, and we weren't even in the same grade. The fact that he knew I had been in the badminton club gave me an eerie feeling. Seeing him hesitate to answer, I felt more unsettled. From then on, I began avoiding him using poor health as an excuse. Instead, my father and mother-in-law started visiting, helping take care of my daughter and assisting with household chores. Although I wished they'd leave me alone, I couldn't bring myself to say it, knowing they were only worried about me. Three months later, the police contacted me, saying they had found my husband's body in the forest. Due to the summer heat and animals, his body was in a terrible condition, 
almost unrecognizable. But his clothes and belongings matched, and his identification and wallet confirmed it was him. Even his father confirmed from the body's build that it was indeed my husband. I was so devastated that I barely remember what happened afterward. My father-in-law and brother-in-law took charge of the funeral arrangements. About a week after the funeral, I finally began to regain a little of my composure. I need to stay strong for Ashley. But as I thought about my daughter, I still couldn't shake the uneasy feeling about my brother-in-law's behavior. He seemed overly curious about the life insurance payout and whether my husband had any savings, as if he were probing for information about the money. In reality, my husband had cancelled his life insurance shortly before he died, so there was very little money left. His family had kindly covered the funeral and burial expenses. About six months after my husband's death, we planned to visit his grave with his family. However, on the day of the visit, my mother-in-law caught a cold, and my father-in-law stayed behind to take care of her. I was going to go alone after leaving Ashley with relatives, but my brother-in-law insisted on coming with me. Although the idea of being alone with him made me uncomfortable, I couldn't find a reason to refuse, so I reluctantly agreed. The grave was halfway up a mountain, and it took about 30 minutes to walk there. As we neared the grave, I felt my brother-in-law's gaze lingering on me. Just as I was about to say something, he suddenly grabbed my arm. Sure. Be quiet. Look over there. He pointed towards the trees, where a man and woman stood embracing. What? No way! When I looked closely, I realized it was my husband, who was supposed to be dead. What I saw there left me speechless. Standing in front of me was a man who looked just like my husband, along with a woman. I was in shock unable to believe my eyes. There's something I need to tell you, Anna. I had barely caught my breath when he dropped another bombshell. But why were they there in the first place? We decided to stay hidden and listen to their conversation. Your grave is quite impressive. Isn't it? I doubt dad or mom had that much money. So maybe my brother paid for it. And they don't even know it's some stranger's bones in there, hilarious. And soon enough, we'll have that $300,000 life insurance. Our plan was a huge success. At that moment, I felt a surge of anger burning inside me. I will never forgive them. They kept chatting away, completely unaware that we were eavesdropping excited about how perfectly their plan had worked. Between their conversation and what my brother-in-law told me, everything started to make sense. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, I began to plot my revenge. A week later, I visited Veronica's apartment. Huh? Anna? What are you doing here without any notice? Her eyes widened in shock when she saw me at the door. My gaze fell to a familiar pair of men's shoes near her feet. Realizing what I noticed, she panicked. Sorry, he's here right now. Oh. You've got someone here? I'd love to meet him. Wait. I can't introduce you yet. He, well, there's some, uh, circumstances. Anna, I'm really sorry, but could you leave for now? It seemed her constant anxiety was all about him. But I wasn't about to let that stop me. I don't need to meet your boyfriend, Veronica. I just need to talk to you. 
I've come into a large sum of money, and I can't figure out how to use it. What? What do you mean? Intrigued, Veronica hurriedly pushed him into a back room, shut the door, and invited me into the dining room. Well, Zach's dad won the lottery. Dollar seven million. Her eyes bulged with shock, and I could hear a low, incredulous what, coming from the other side of the door. Clearly, he was listening in. So, his father wants to split it between Zach's brother, me, and Ashley. I'm thinking about using the money to buy property, but I wanted your advice. You're telling me they're splitting seven million dollars between just three people. At that exact moment, the door to the back room swung open with a bang. This is a joke, right? I have a right to that money too. Emerging from the room with clenched fists and a face flushed with anger was none other than Zach. Oh my, you're alive? What are you doing here? Uh, well. I questioned him coldly, and he began mumbling excuses. I was struggling with work and went to the forest, planning to end it all. But I couldn't go through with it. Apparently, while he was contemplating his fate, he stumbled upon a dead man who looked similar to him and decided to switch their identities by placing his own ID on the body. He intended to disappear, but fate had him cross paths with Veronica, who helped him. Zack rattled off a series of lies designed to make himself look like the victim, but I wasn't fooled. The part about faking his death was true, but the rest was a transparent attempt to protect himself. I know everything. What? What are you talking about? I calmly revealed the truth I had uncovered. Zach had been cheating on me with Veronica for a long time, hiding it from me. His whole scheme, to fake his death, was to cash in on his life insurance. He had stolen my insurance card, and Veronica had been posing as me to file the claim. That's nonsense. You have no proof. You're just trying to frame me, aren't you? I get it, you want the lottery money. Greedy woman. I'm not giving it to a stranger like you. With fury twisting his face, Zack spewed insults at me. But I spread out the evidence of his infidelity. Photos, courtesy of my brother-in-law, across the table. Both Zach and Veronica went pale as they stared at the images. What the hell is this? When? I even have audio recordings. I could play them for you right now. Max had stumbled upon Zach and Veronica entering a hotel together by chance. He snapped pictures and recorded Zach's voice, boasting, Soon, we'll have a huge sum of money. When he later heard Zach had died, he grew suspicious and came to me with his findings. Max hadn't been sure whether Zach was truly alive, and he didn't want to upset me without proof. But then we saw Zach and Veronica near the grave. I'll kill you. In a fit of rage, Zach charged at me, his face contorted into a monstrous expression. Terrified. I dashed toward the door. As I reached it, there was a loud knock from the other side. When I unlocked the door, my father-in-law and Max burst in. They had been waiting outside and had heard everything through a speakerphone connection with Max's phone. Furious, they grabbed Zack and beat him down. Ow! Stop! Anna! Help me. You threw away me and Ashley for your mistress. Oh, and that lottery? It was just a dream your father had. What? You tricked me. 
You're one to talk. I simply gave you a taste of your own medicine. Zack glared at me with pure hatred, but he was pinned down by his father and Max. Meanwhile, Veronica stood frozen in shock. Insurance fraud is a serious crime. The two of you can rot in jail and think about what you've done. No. Please. Don't call the police. It was all Veronica's idea. What? You're going to betray me now? You're the one who said Anna was boring and convinced me. No, I didn't. Anna, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. We've been friends for so long. Forget Zack, just save me. Even as they turned on each other, begging for mercy, I was completely disappointed. I never had a kind husband or a loyal friend. I never want to see your faces again. They finally realized there was no escape. Defeated, they broke down in tears. In the end, both of them were arrested for insurance fraud and found guilty. I divorced Zack and demanded 2 million yen in alimony and 15 million yen in child support. Since Zack had no savings, the house was transferred into my name for repayment. I also demanded 1.5 million yen from Veronica, which she paid in full from her savings. Zack was disowned by his family, and his crime cost him his job. I heard he and Veronica now live in a rundown apartment, constantly fighting, but that's no longer my concern. As for Max, it turns out he's a shy and serious man. Back in middle school, he had feelings for me while I was on the badminton team but never confessed. When Zack announced he was marrying me, Max was shocked and couldn't bring himself to face me, which I mistakenly interpreted as dislike. He adored Ashley and wanted to protect me when trouble came my way. Although I've just gotten divorced, and I'm not ready to respond to Max's feelings yet, I appreciate his kindness. His parents, too, have been incredibly supportive of me and Ashley. For my daughter's sake, I'll keep living my life with a smile. How did you like today's story? Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. See you in the next video.